on a federal level, this is what we must do. Federal government must establish uh, reparations that's consistent with even with the United Nations states. Uh, co compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, um, and restitution, right? And what I put together was a reparations plan that addressed that. One is a monetary reparations to address racial wealth gap. It was uh, at a bare minimum of $14 trillion, which is addressing the, uh, the, the racial wealth gap. And this isn't something I just made up off the top of my head. This is uh, something that was uh, established by way of, of William, doc, Dr. William Darity and Dr. William uh, Kirsten Mullen, I mean, Dr. Kirsten Mullen, who established From Here to Equality which was stating that these are some of these uh, tangible ways that you could address providing reparations. One of them is the cash restitution aspect. So I say mm -hmm. you provide at minimum $14 trillion to address this, as well as section two addresses the land grants to black Americans. And why is the land grants important? Uh, for one, this country failed to deliver on its 40 acres of a mule. Right. This is something that this, co this country still not just failed at delivering the 40 acres of a mule. It, created policies that further the land in uh, in uh, in uh, inequitable outcomes like when we deal with the homestead act and this is with us mr tariq shabazz hey how's everybody going uh thank thank you so much for affording me this opportunity to be here yeah thank you very much for coming on uh now one of the things that i always ask the candidates when they come on this channel is why are you running for senate what is it that uh, you feel that you could change or improve within the United States that we haven't seen before? And just to let you guys know, you are running outside of the duopoly. All right. Uh, absolutely. A number of things. Firstly, uh, throughout the United States of America, we have a two party duopoly that controls all the social, economic, political and military uh, interests of the United States. And as a result of this, this is something that we don't take into account is that how much these uh, parties or factions, they are uh, one in the same as it pertains to international conflict abroad, um, directly providing more arms and support of tensions, conflict, genocides that are occurring um, throughout the world. Whereas on a domestic level, they find whatever areas that they bicker on. But however, when it comes still to uh, implementing policy, their policy is abysmal. Uh, when it comes to how do you address the fact that uh, two, 2023 uh, to 2024, you saw the most homeless people go, um, in any given year recognized by HUD. Uh, when you look at statistics like that, what that illustrates is that we can no longer count on this current structure. This current structure is falling upon itself and the people who are harmed the most are us, the people. And this is an area where myself as a U.S. Senator, uh, I have a unique background. Firstly, I'm a black American man who directly uh, descends from individuals who were held in U.S. child slavery in this country. So that directly means that I'm going to advocate for what is reparations to provide that uh, restitution that is directly owed to those individuals who descend from those who were held in U.S. child slavery. Also, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. So I do understand, um, especially as it pertains to the wars and things in that nature internationally, the importance of us not just talking about we need to safeguard American interests, but we need to truly make sure that we're taking into account the lives that are at stake. I used to say this when I was in the service all the time. Don't call uh, when they used to ask people, hey, we need a body to do something. The term would be a body. And I would say, don't ever call me a body. I'm a human being and I'm a, ser I'm a sailor. So don't call me that. Um, and that's one of those things that, that goes on, that rhetoric, that understanding. Oftentimes it doesn't take into account that we're dealing with human lives at stake as opposed to statistics. And we're absolutely controlled by the defense industry. And these are areas where I know that as the senator, um, you won't see someone who's uh, corporate control, and you definitely won't see someone who is controlled by some outside foreign uh, nation that is uh, violating immense number of uh, of our laws, uh, so they can uh, influence our our elections. And I'll talk about that in more depth later. Thank you very much for that. Sorry, I was muted. But one of the things that uh, I like to focus on, and I was telling you this uh, beforehand, is that a lot of times people talk about, uh, as far as being a spoiler for the, the either party, the particularly a lot of times we'll talk about the Democratic Party, especially if you have uh, policies that are more in a progressive direction. And so I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but as far as uh, you know, policies concerned, 
I feel like when it comes to looking at candidates, we should focus on the ingredients first, right? right. And see what's good for that candidate. And feel free to chime in any time. Okay. But it, it, the, it feels like uh, we spend more time on that than we do on the policies. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is to talk about your policy platform to show the difference. And a lot of times people will say, well, the you know that's going to spoil it for the Democrats. And it's like, the radical that I am, I say, good, good. And I'm gonna chime in on that part right here too. Uh, please. The Democrats do not own people. I, I don't understand. Like this is where I, you know, I get extremely irate regarding this part of the, the democratic process. Mm-hmm. It's a democracy. It is predicated on the basis that you have the right to suffrage and in exchange for it, you say, hey, do I like this candidate. I like these issues. And I'm going to vote for it. So in exchange, we, it's a, it's, it is a legal quid pro quo. I will vote for this if this is somebody who I like. I will vote and based upon whatever those issues may be. Oftentimes what happens is the Democrats, firstly, they control, again, they work alongside Republicans to uh, make sure that third party candidates don't have the ability, firstly, to gain any legitimacy through the media side of things because it's all corporate and legacy controlled. Then you have on the other aspect of it is uh, from the direct standpoint that they work to remove candidates in issues that's off the ballot that actually oppose their ideologies. The Mm -hmm. Democrats in itself, they are anti-democratic. I've called them out numerous times and they should still need to be called out for even the process of how uh, Vice President Kamala Harris has assumed the next position to be running for president, right? When you take into account that President Biden, everyone had knew for from for years that he was, I don't want to utilize the term incompetent, but he was not adequately equipped or prepared to be in this all uh, be in the office he barely could even handle ma- uh, major um events on an international stage i mean he's calling world leaders the opposing world leaders in middle of war con- wars and conflict i mean it, it just illustrated already he was not in um in his place and he didn't know what he was doing but that administration has been sending you know hurling billions of dollars to genocides so i mean yeah. You have to you have to call it out on what it is because the Democrats that's their game. They create this idea notion that a third party candidate or third parties are spoiling it for them, but they're spoiling it for themselves. They're the ones who are in power. How can you be in power right now for the last three plus years, about four years, and mm-hmm. you have given billions and billions of dollars to the state of Israel? while it is directly committing a genocide, right? And and I've been I was one of the first ones as a candidate to call it out. My local media made sure they ignored all of these things. I'm the only candidate, the only veteran that was in a race that was that was calling it out. I ran I, I said I was an independent early on, saying that we needed to uh, go against the two party duopoly. Unfortunately for us, the Green Party in the state of Ohio did not have this status. And that's a whole nother dis- discussion in itself there is why didn't they have their status? Because Democrats and Republicans worked together to make sure that it was more difficult for third parties to maintain their ballot access. And that's a whole nother discussion in itself. Yeah. So one of the things and thank you very much for that. One of the things that um, I, uh, I'm checking right now. Um, as far as uh, your opponent, I think your opponent is Sherrod Brown. Yeah, so it's uh, U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown, as well as the Republican uh, is Bernie Moreno. And I'm currently a write-in candidate because we filed a massive lawsuit. We That was another thing. We had to get 5,000 signatures to be an independent because the third party wasn't on the ballot, right? Because we had no Green Party. The Green Party, you would have to, if the Green Party was uh, in its uh, status, you would only have to get about 250, um, 250, or I'm sorry, 500 signatures, right? As a minority party. But as a majority party, the majority parties, they only had to get 1,000 signatures. But if you were to have to run as an independent, you had to get 5,000 signatures. Wait, hold on. That's yeah, yeah. weird. Five, Why five. in the world is it because the Democratic Party, Republican Party have a lot more infrastructure in order to be able to get the 5,000 signatures. So why shouldn't it be more incumbent upon them to have to get the 5,000 signatures and you get the 1,000? That doesn't make any sense. 
This is the and that's the the argument, you know, that you see in some of the court cases is that you have to uh, establish what is a modicum of support and whatnot. And then we we also, like I said, we fought our case into the uh, federal federal courts and we filed our uh, lawsuit against the state saying that they had unconstitutional measures as it pertains to ballot access, uh, stating that it should never have independence, that you have to produce five times the amount that the major parties have to produce. And that was exactly the understanding is that they have the legitimate infrastructure in place to easily flourish and grab, grab, gather those signatures. In our situation, we just got slightly under the 5,000 margin. And I mean, we were moving out there, moving it all across the cities. But then, unfortunately, we didn't have the, the 5,000 verified. So on March 18th, when we went down to Columbus, we had all we had all our packs of signatures and we went through them and said, we're just slightly under. It's probably better that we file, we file this as a write-in officially to know that we're going to be in, in this race. And then we file the official suit. And that's what we did. We filed the official suit after. And when we filed the official suit, we went into the courts for a few months. Um, unfortunately, it didn't go in our favor. And they said that we're still going to be a write-in candidate. And that's something that it sucks. But this is, the, this is the thing that we were saying. We're not playing spoiler. If we were playing spoiler, we wouldn't be taking this serious. This is a serious deal. We're talking about right now who is going to be leading over our nation. I mean, leading over our state um, as a senator. And who's going to be actually sending the resources to our people here to make sure we have housing fundamentally for all of our Americans, that we have health care. And I even noticed that amongst the Democrats, Medicare for all was something that actually mattered for a, a while ago. Now it doesn't even almost exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, it, unfortunately, it doesn't. And yet uh, one thing I notice is that, you know, uh, the third parties and particularly the Green Party, which uh, just from a full disclosure, I am press co-press director for the Jill Stein campaign. But my thing is, it's like we should, you know, they're, they're the only ones that are really talking about not just a Medicare for all single payer health care system, but also mm -hmm. even pushing for a nationalized health care system in, in totality, just like they have in the UK. So I don't hear anybody else really talking about that outside of, you know, parties or independence outside of duopoly. So it just goes to show where the, the Democratic Party in particular will use these different types of policies that are really winners. They, they're, they're no brainers for the American people. And yet they'll use it as a tool to get you to vote for them. But then once those votes are cast for them, they go, new phone, who this? <laughs> and so this is exactly what they always do. And I, I and this is why I'm sick and tired. You know, we're, we're pushing for people who are actually going to be fighting for the actual policy, not just rhetorically, but also, I don't care if you get black guys, bumps and bruises and you're limping away, as long as you got the fighting, that's what matters. And I think a lot of people are missing sight of that. Um, yeah. But that being said, speaking of fighting, I would like to go to your policy positions. Okay. And we're going to go, I'm gonna go line by line because I would like to cover and get your thoughts on different ones. Uh, so one of the things I, <laughs> I appreciate about you, Tariq, is that in your policy position, you came in hot. You came in hot. You said anti-war and ending the military industrial complex. Homeboy, you had me at ending the military industrial complex already. So it says here, Tariq Shabazz advocates for reducing military spending and reallocating resources to address domestic uh, issues. By advocating for a more peaceful foreign policy, he aims to decrease military intervention and prioritize diplomacy and international cooperation. Shabazz believes that redirecting funds from the military industrial complex towards education, healthcare, infrastructure, and job creation will better serve the needs of American citizens and promote a more equitable society. So uh, you say here you will scrutinize defense budgets for its necessities, promoting the well-being of all service members and veterans, while advocating for the re reduction of appropriations to correspond with the American agenda of peace and prosperity on an international stage. Uh, you talk about, um, it says you, you will support and defend the U.S. Constitution and will continue his life. You, you as a ver veteran have supported and defended U.S. Constitution. Uh, so and I could touch on that too if you want me to that portion really quickly. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so in terms of what I say about uh, how I want to scrutinize defense budgets, uh, again, uh, as I talked about the military industrial complex, I got out of active duty from the United States Navy in 2019. In the moment I got out of active duty from uh, from Uni United States Navy, I ran for become the House of Representatives uh, against uh, the former Secretary of HUD, Marsha Fudge. I came in second place to her. We never debated. We never got to be in the same space. Uh, there was four candidates in that race. And in that, I directly talked about the importance of ending the mil military industrial complex. So I work primarily in time, uh, I work primarily in maintenance and, uh, and in working in maintenance, I was able to see, you know, some of the, you know, horrific things pertaining to like the cost of, you know, of supplies, the, all of these things from the logistical operation standpoint, right? And they, and they gave me a much broader understanding of that our, our U.S. military, our defense system in itself is, again, it's highly bloated. It's a highly bloated uh, operational budget. And then we there's a lot of propaganda that creates an impression that they're taking care of our service members and our veterans. So we lose 22 veterans a day due to suicide, right? And that's something that I've dealt with suicide in my own ser in time of service of service members who were uh, near me uh, who have committed suicide. And it's, a, it's, it's so adversely uh, to the people, to the morale of everyone around. And one of the things you take into account is how are we doing so piss poor while we're spending, you know, 700, 800 billion dollars for defense? Well, how do we do that? It's because all of the money is going to these defense co uh, corporations, the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins. I mean, the Raytheons. The Lo I mean, all, I mean, we know the names. And for the individuals who don't know some of those names, we have to understand why is it that a five star general who's president left office and said, we need to do something about this rising influence that the defense industries were having. And this is something that still since that day. Right. Since Eisenhower left, it has seen an increase of resources that are going substantially into the defense industries and the defense industries profit off of war. Right. So as it pertains to them profiting off of the war, it is only going to lead to an increase of more dollars. Like when it comes to the war in Ukraine and Russia, I've talked about this slightly, is that. The U.S. knows that it's posturing itself that it can continue to spend and hurl as much money into the Ukraine-Russia war for a couple of reasons. One, they view it that they view it from a military standpoint that as long as Ukraine and R Russia are fighting, the number of lives lost uh, from Russia's uh, service members only he helps the military capabilities of the U.S. That's their that's their mindset, and as a result, it's not to sure seriously take into account that we're just hurling dollars into people just killing each other, where we could have easily worked to try to stop this conflict. We should have never been uh, providing uh, the state of Ukraine cluster munitions, illegal in over 100 countries. That's something when I talk about the, uh, scrutinizing, I would never acknowledge, I would never allow something like that as a senator. I would never allow the fact that we know that Israel is committing a genocide. I would never allow another dollar to go to their country. Their government itself is corrupt. It is committing mass violations, right? And that's what I mean about scrutinizing and just in that sense. Do I support uh, suspending the, the defense budget up to 10%? Up to 20%, honestly. More than up, up to 20% because we're projecting in the next 10 years we can hit up to a trillion dollars defense budgets. So... Yes, I'm heavily in support of uh, cutting up to about 20% of the defense budget. Um, and that's that's something I, I'm looking to do, cut about 20%. Okay. So uh, another thing that uh, is uh, in your platform as well, because you have mentioned what's going on in Gaza, uh, it says you will not support the war in Gaza and has cause for a ceasefire. He will not commit to further military aid to the state of Israel, as it will be condoning the mass killing of women and children. Uh, so would that also mean a uh, uh, an arms embargo, which has been called upon for uh, yes. for Vice President Bucca? <laughs> yeah, can't. absolutely. They don't. It's not another dollar that should go go to the country um, at all because it's only contributing to um, advancing more of its offensive capabilities. And as it's advancing more of its offensive capabilities, we're seeing it on everyday scale right now. Uh, a regional war that has uh, escalated beyond, as they stated, was to go and seek back their hostages, right? And then now they're in multiple other countries waging uh, warfare. And 
how are they doing this? It's because the United States posture is enabling it, right? When we move our, our, our ships and our carriers over into those regions and saying that we're there in just in case, we're green lighting it. We are saying that this is acceptable. And I know as a senator, President Biden, if I have President Harris, or if it is her being president, or if it's Trump, if it's uh, Jill Stein, everyone is going to have to come to us and ask for those resources or ask for these mobilizations. You don't just say we're going to move this here to in supporting of, the, of this conflict when we know it was wrong from the jump. These are the areas where we have to address that, too. And I don't want to talk too much on that. And I guess I mean, I talked too much, but I want to sit for a question. Mm -hmm. when I start. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm not going to play this video. Okay. But I do want to share this because I have to be careful with uh, warfare. But I will show a still of this. Right now, this is actually from Sky News. Sky News is actually reporting that Iran has actually launched missiles right now into Israel. This was taken about an hour ago. So this just goes to show that this uh, Israel is really escalating things uh, to a fever pitch within the region, you have uh, you have uh, you know uh, Iran now uh, retaliating uh, against uh, Israel's murder of Nasrallah. You now also have retaliation against Israel for not just what they've done in Gaza, but for also what they have done in Lebanon. And so this is turning into, or dare I say, we're already in a World War III. It's just you don't really know the name of it until after the fact. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this, I, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, I mean, I looked at numerous reports a couple of years, uh, not a couple of years, but a year ago, when you see multiple countries that were talking about the importance of having their militaries be operational or at least they could be fully optimized by like 2027. When you hear things like that, I mean, we know that's a, the you know war efforts are ratcheting up and then we're seeing actual hot conflict. Right. For hot, we see that there's actual physical conflict. People are dying. Human beings are losing their lives. Um, and then we also have to take into account the other things that happen as a result of the con of, of war is how many individuals who are on long term health care or uh, health care uh, related support that now they may not be able to get those critical supplies. Uh, now we took take into account like when we look into Gaza. Right. That the state of Israel, its government was still blocking aid is going in. So that is going to cause, you know, an immense number of other deaths that occur. That is not directly through uh, by way of the uh, arms that were used. This is other areas of the war that happens. Right. When you block people from receiving resources like that. Uh, that's going to cause more deaths. That's going to cause death tolls to increase. And that is something that needs to be taken into account that the uh, that the state of Israel wasn't just indiscriminate in its pathways of what it was doing. It was very deliberate. Uh, it was har it's harming them, the, the civilians. It's directly harming them and they're aware of it. Um, and on the next step about that, uh, it, it's it's one of those areas where for us as citizens, we have to take into account how do you get to this point? It's because of the part, uh, part, point that I made earlier that we have rising po super political action committees that are working for you know the better good of their uh, of another country right foreign interests they should like apac is a is a political action committee super pac that should be recognized as a foreign super pac right it, it's directly advocating and coming to our country and telling all of our getting all of our leaders i don't know what kind of dirt they have on all of these people but i mean they're lock in step with almost everything that they want and it's disgusting yeah so would you be willing to either sponsor or draft legislation that would force apac to uh register as a foreign agent if elected senator yes and that's something i've touched on um in uh, within the last within this year as well that i would absolutely do that because i believe apac is it's it is what it is what it is i mean we know it's for it's a it's working as a foreign agent on behalf of the state of israel um, it's bribing politicians to literally just look the other way, give us more money and we'll do whatever we want. And we'll just, all you have to say is that you will always defend us. 
you know, you will always support our right to defend ourselves. And I served in the U.S. Navy, and I still call out the fact that our U.S. military is a vi- it violates internationally, right? Imperialism is something I call out all the time. So why would I not call out a state of Israel when I didn't even serve it, serve in, and I'm not, I'm not a citizen of that state? I don't understand what's happening here by so many of our uh, public officials, elected officials. It is really illustrating that something. Um, very sinister is happening beneath the surface and it's not being addressed publicly. Yeah, I, I honestly personally would say that everybody who gets money from any of the uh, Israel PACs are compromised, but that's me saying that, not you. So I just wanted to clarify. Uh, so moving, moving on, uh, it's you say that you also support uh the diplomatic relations within the region that has strategic plan for peace to end the apartheid the establishment of a two-state solution recognizing israel and palestine uh which uh, i know that a lot of the, the the palestinian resistance actually supported uh for the most part you know, uh so, this is a tough one right you know this is a tough one because the question is how do you end the situation right mm-hmm. uh, for me again you can't be go back to, as they say, prior to October 7th, right? 2024. You still have to take into account that there was a vicious occupation that is that was occurring for years prior, right? Where you had the, just a few years ago, Gaza had 3 million people, then it went down to 2 million people, right? Um, and then in the sense of, it, it can't just we go back to normal, normalizing the situation. The state of Israel must be held accountable uh, in the international bodies. So I will be working, I will, as a Senator, work directly, whatever through my powers to make sure that on the international body, that we recognize that the state of Israel uh, was committing terrorism, has committed terrorism and has committed a genocide. So wherever that uh, leads to, um, whether that's, you know, potential shifts in uh, governmental leaders and arrest for certain individuals like Netanyahu, I'm in support of his arrest. I believe it was uh, actually reprehensible that he came to the United States of America, was b- basically given a red carpet, come into our, our country and speak with such conviction regarding the matters uh, as if that he's on the right side of history. And then also to go and parade it again on the international body, you know, <laughs> where he has, you know, warrants for him. I mean, it, it's, it's, Nick, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I, I I feel you, and to be honest with you, I actually agree with your uh, your frustration and anger uh, in regards to this subject because uh, honestly, I am sick and tired of seeing uh, the 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 carnage that has been done to people within the region uh, because uh, you know you have a genocidal a uh, maniac like Benjamin Netanyahu, who continues his project of greater Israel in order to just take over the region. And I've spoke about this before, but if you actually do some, if people actually Google uh, about uh, Israel, uh, well, really the, the UN finding that they have uh, billions of tons of liquefied natural gas, as well as oil off the coast of Gaza, and as well as the Great Israel Project and the plan to build a Ben Gurion Canal, then you realize that this more has to do with just money and resources than it ever has to do with anything religious at all. Mm -hmm. Because to be honest with you, this is not anything about religion. This is pure settler colonialism. Uh, Basically what happens here on this land and what the United States has done throughout the global South, particularly in Africa. So. That's the way I see it. Um, you know, it's always interesting how we describe uh, our the nations internationally when we uh, make the distinction of the global north, global south, or developed states versus peripheral states, right? Um, and then we have to take into account how to what are you know the major issues or uh, that's attenuating the global south from advancing. 
is the global north or you know western powers uh, uh extracting raw materials from those countries while you know making sure that there are horrible uh, loans on the books whether it's through uh imf world bank whatever the case may be where it makes it so much more difficult for those uh countries in themselves that has all these raw materials that are absolutely necessary within the developed states uh for us to develop major technologies and things in that nature and you see it uh this is a this is an issue that can't just get, you know, we can't keep glossing over. And that's what I mean about the imperialism um, of the United States of America still uh, with the Western powers. Um, but I know we had a little time. I wanted to kind of touch base on massive domestic domestic issues that I want to really address, uh, Senator. Yeah. Uh, can course. I can I touch on reparations first and then move to the other ones? Because I want to because I think oftentimes we skip. This is a, a tough topic for people to move on. And I think that I need to provide the adequate amount of nuance on it. All right. So for everyone out there, um, what is the importance of passing reparations for black American descendants of U.S. child slavery? Well, first, you have to take into account that since the inception of the United States of America, this country was predicated on um, per, creating a bottom caste status for black Americans. And this is something that is proven in evidence prior to uh, the actual formation of the US, right? In the colonial Americas, we take into account that slavery was something that was uh, sanctioned and recognized that it was perfectly okay. The women that were uh, enslaved, it was perfectly fine for you know enslavers to rape the women and then to have offspring that were considered, that they were considered not uh, the status of the father. And this is something that was different in other places, right? They didn't have to have the status of the father. And as a result, mm -hmm. that means that it green lighted the mass raping of women, black women, and to have offspring children that you can just consider them that they're going to be chattel as well, right? So this is something that I address on a number of ways why it's important. The United States built up mass power, influence, wealth, through uh, the uh, the creation and the um, sanctioning of U.S. shadow slavery, right? Some let's talk about the political power that was provided. When you look into the state, you know the United States of America. Now you have three governors that was ever black. How does that happen? That is another area of it. You uh, have absolutely attenuated political infrastructure to be able to be yielded towards black Americans, and this is th thrown uh, shown through its uh, every iteration of the government building up, right? So when you have the Constitutional Convention in 1787, this is after the Articles of Confederation. If anyone who's paying attention, who's reading it, uh, after the, the uh, Articles of Confederation, they said, what do we do about the slaves? Even though we need to build a more central uh, government, the state government system was too fractured. It didn't work. So they said, we need to do something to make it more central. So they created an elected president and established the U.S. Senate. Right. So and even in this practice of establishing these things, this was to further the influence of white Americans. This was not to create or establish an equitable balance. This was to further it. Right. It means that now you can have a senator senators for a state that represent the entire state and their influence yields magnificent. I mean, ma ma uh, <laughs> immense, um, in immense impact. Right. So. You have to take into account that this reparations must be paid because the federal government created the bottom cash status and it's harmed us on a multitude of levels, uh, as I stated, politically, economically, uh, socially, uh, all throughout this country. So politically, it's evidence of how I stated that since this country kept building power, we can talk about the three fifths compromise. We can even mm -hmm. talk about as we go into the 1877 compromise, the 1877 compromise is what essentially failed reconstruction right after the 13th Amendment. When this country failed uh, the black Americans, it, it left them into state sanctioned terrorism. And this is the reason for why you must still provide this restitution to address the harm that was for U.S. shadow slavery, the failed Reconstruction era, and then to leave our Black American people into state section terrorism into the South. And then ultimately, which I don't call the Great Migration, I would say that ultimately led to the great displacement of Black Americans from the South going into the West, uh, uh, upward into the North and Western states as a result of making it so much more difficult for black Americans to advance. Then you can take into account some of the massive terrorist attacks that occurred that the federal government, which again is the ultimate sanctioning body, 
did not do enough to protect, provide restitution for any of these people. Tulsa, Oklahoma still is a topic of, of the century right now. We have still multiple living uh, individuals who were impacted by Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, and still did not receive reparations from their state. And that's from their state addressing the harm that it done. So on a federal level, this is what we must do. Federal government must establish uh, reparations that's consistent with even with the United Nations states. Uh, co compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, um, and restitution, right? And what I put together was a reparations plan that addressed that. One is a monetary reparations to address racial wealth gap. It was uh, at a bare minimum of $14 trillion, which is addressing the, uh, the, the racial wealth gap. And this isn't something I just made up off the top of my head. This is uh, something that was uh, established by way of, of William, doc, Dr. William Darity and Dr. William uh, Kirsten Mullen, I mean, Dr. Kirsten Mullen, who established From Here to Equality which was stating that these are some of these uh, tangible ways that you could address providing reparations. One of them is the cash restitution aspect. So I say mm -hmm. you provide at minimum $14 trillion to address this, as well as section two addresses the land grants to black Americans. And why is the land grants important? Uh, for one, this country failed to deliver on its 40 acres of a mule, right? This is something that this, co this country still not just failed at delivering the 40 acres of a mule, it, created policies that further the land in uh, in uh, in uh, inequitable outcomes like when we deal with the homestead act and this is something yeah. on my I touch base on the homestead act provided millions of acres of land to white americans as well as immigrating white americans into the nation which has established intergenerational wealth for white americans these are just areas that again that's one aspect of how land was distributed. And then we take into account how much of the land that has been adequately taken through uh, from black Americans, not just through physical violence, but strategically being utilized through tax systems or other ways to rob black Americans of their land that, would, that is rightfully theirs. So this is important that our, our government has to establish these protecting forces. So section three, a permanent protective status for black American ethnicity. And that is important, right? So that's extremely important. So that's to protect uh, these these people uh, permanently uh, to look into all of these future cases, the things that are occurring Section four, political disparities and representation. This is the areas where I talk about the importance of establishing automatic districts, Friedman districts, which is highlighting when you see the civil, when you see those lawsuits that are happening where people are suing saying, according to the 14th amendment, this is supposed to have a majority minority district. We're saying specifically that it's not supposed to be a majority minority that this is uh, that constitution, uh, that amendment was predicated on. It was supposed to be establishing for those black American people so they could establish political footing. And that was robbed of them. So as a result of it, this country still must provide the adequate amount of uh, what is black American or Freedman districts for them to actually matriculate into the House of Representatives and so on and so forth, as well as from the federal government down to the state subordinate governments and the so, reestablishment. Sorry. Well, just a question. So, uh, as far as just to make sure that we have clarification. Yes. Uh, right. when, it, when you talk about reparations for uh, black people who are descendants of slaves. Uh, there are many people from many different regions who say, I'm a descendant of slaves. My descendants of slaves come from Jamaica, or my descendants of slaves comes from Haiti, or my descendants of slaves comes from Brazil. Are you referring to all Black people within the United States, or are you going towards a specific group of Black people for their revolution? Yeah, so uh, this this form of reparations is specific to address the Black Americans who were uh, impacted by U.S. chattel slavery. And I understand the sentiment oftentimes uh, nationally that's going on where, hey, well, there are other other groups that were adversely impacted by slavery. And that's not what I, I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that 
this didn't happen and it wasn't egregious. What I'm addressing is that the U.S. federal government sanctioned the practice of the slavery that happened to black Americans, which we understand that since it sanctioned it, we understand that, again, even going back to the United Nations, is that this government has to address the harm that it did specifically to those people, to those groups of individuals, their descendants. This isn't, you know, anything negative towards other groups that were adversely impacted by slavery. This is specifically saying this is the policy to address the harm to black Americans who were harmed by U.S. child slavery. And it will be consistent with things like, for instance, internationally, you have po uh, public policies like CARICOM. CARICOM only impacts individuals who are in those Caribbean states as opposed to black Americans. They don't, the black Americans cannot take a, take a piece of any aspect of any of that, right? So it's not saying that it's a bad thing. It's saying that this country has to address this fundamental harm that it, can, it has done on these black Americans because it has continuously have left them in some of the most horrific conditions. When we talk about the racial wealth gap, when you look mm -hmm. at the Brooklyn Institute's um, research that talks about the racial wealth gap this year and uh, that came out this year, uh, Biden said that the racial wealth gap has improved. And that was absolutely false. He was able to do that, check it quickly. He said it improved in the last 20 years. The reports illustrated that, no, it, it did not. It said that black wealth has increased, but it did not increase proportionally to white wealth, which indicates that it did not uh, increase in terms of the uh, decrease the racial wealth gap, which would mean that that was a flat out lie. And why is it that the racial wealth gap does not uh, shift uh, naturally is because it was manufactured. And these are areas, again, we have to address the fact that these harms were manufactured specifically to black Americans, specifically. Yeah. So uh, this is one of the reasons why the really reasons why I bring this up is because you have a lot of black people that will say, well, what about people who are, you know, my family that are immigrant black people who have came here from, you know, you can name a different African country. It could be, you know, Ethiopia, Mozambique. It could be, uh, you know, um, uh, Gambia. And they'll say, well, I was impacted, you know, from, you know, the, the, the prison industrial complex or, you know, racial profile and things like that, which is, I try to specify that that is more a, um, that's more for post uh, Jim Crow, post slavery uh, grievances that has to be also correct addressed as well. Yeah. But when it comes to reparations, that is a lineage based lineage issue. Basis. And that's what I have on my policies. It's lineage basis. Yeah. I think it, I think oftentimes on the Internet spaces, it gets really the discussions they break down, they don't really stay nuanced on why it's important that there must be lineage basis. Yeah. It must be lineage basis for a legal standpoint. Firstly, you can't yeah. establish a policy that uplifts one race or the other. So when we establish the lineage based reparations, it's specifically saying this policy is for those who were harmed. Right. It's not for all black people. Right. Because it's saying, no, we know that right now, currently, the U.S. census will say somewhere around there, there is potentially up to what, 40 to 50 million pro, uh, black people. Black, uh, black citizens, right? Race wise. Mm -hmm. However, all of those citizens would not be eligible for the reparations for the individuals who were harmed by U.S. chattel slavery, failed reconstruction and that so on and so forth. And then another part I want to take in, add in is that when you immigrate into a nation, you do immigrate into a country understanding that the historical things that has happened in this country, you are not necessarily absolved from it. And I hear this, from, and this is not from black immigrants per, per, uh, specifically, but this is something I hear in terms of people who immigrate. They'll say, well, my family immigrated here in the 1920s, 1930s. And they'll say, mm -hmm. well, I, I was never a slave. You were never a slave. We don't owe, we shouldn't have to pay for it. And my answer to that every time is, is, your people still immigrated into a country that committed mass harm to black Americans. It doesn't remove or absolve the fact that that country, federal government still is on the hook to pay it. Right. And that may make individuals uncomfortable. But guess what? Just like whenever we see our legislators are voting and passing legislation that absolutely we disagree with all the time. This is something we have to understand is that this government has to provide that repair. That's it. I mean, it's it's pretty simple when I deal with and I touch bases on different types of reparations all the time. We can go back to the Emancipation Proclamation of D.C. Act. Abraham Lincoln, the president at the time, signed a law that said, 
I'm going to provide restitution to slave owners to relinquish their slaves. And in that, they were paying. That was the that was their their game plan is that providing monetary or, or economic as, uh, assistance that would be a way to loosen or reduce the tensions militarily speaking, because more people will be more willing to uh, get rid of their uh, slaves. And they only provided a few dollars for those who were enslaved to immigrate out of the country, not to actually receive their reparations. And you can go into various forms of reparations that Native American tribes that have received, or you could address the fact that in most recently, the uh, Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which was passed for Japanese Americans who were adversely impacted by internment camps during World War II. I would be wrong if I say, I don't think that those Japanese Americans deserve represent reparations because they did deserve it. Their people were held in internment camps under the guise that they were spies. And then it was land grabs, all of these other things that were occurring during that process, right? So that would be wrong for me to say that. But oftentimes the sentiment or the rhetoric becomes extremely anti-reparations when it's under the uh, when it's understanding is for black Americans. Right. Even though black Americans are the only group that was held in bondage in this country. No other group had, can say that that happened to them in this country. That is the wealthiest nation on earth that's been able to hurl billions and billions of dollars everywhere else while saying it can't pay black Americans for what they've done to their people. It's kind of interesting that you mention that because a lot of times people will say, well, uh, you weren't a slave, so therefore you're not owed. And the funny thing is, is that you have these uh, companies that will try to collect the debt on uh, the person who deceased from their next of kin. And I'm like, if that's the case, then these companies should be barred from ever trying to collect any debt on uh, the deceased. Like, yeah, it's just incorrect. It's it's incorrect. It's one of those areas, again, uh, whether or not people agree specifically with my policy of providing reparations. And I believe that my policy is generally consistent across the board with others. There are some other leaders in the reparation space who are advocating for a 60 trillion dollar measure um, to address the cash restitution aspect of it. And even when we take into account that number, it sounds like it's so staggering. You have to take into account. This isn't something that has to just be paid in one year, right? It could be something that could be done over a 10 year span. And in general, for the economic standpoint, when we deal about how inflation will be impacted by it, uh, again, I would refer to many individuals to check out and listen to scholars in these ec and the economic forces about this because they directly already uh, highlighted uh, how we would could potentially reduce the inflationary uh, risk associated with passing such a measure to provide reparations. And those are areas of those leaders. I would make sure I bring these people in as I'm in implementing and drafting the official bill. I think that that's what also gets really conflated is that a senator has immense amount of resources, support, staff uh, at their, you know, right at their fingertips whenever is necessary. So when it comes to drafting the legislation about this, this will be something that will be direct. It'll be, cons it'll be uh, driven by the data. It won't be just someone making up numbers. It's driven by the data to make sure that we can adequately address the harm. And as I said, we must be we must provide the economics must address the land and we have to dry, uh, pr create a freedman bureau which is going to be that that organization that's the glue that makes sure that all of the interests on behalf of those black american descendants are receiving what they uh what they're owed and wow. that's Sorry, my reparations that. plan and everyone here please check it out check it out check it out please mm -hmm. um uh, how much time do you have left um, I can go for another good 15 minutes or so. Okay. Okay. So yeah. if I could, I want to uh, just say, I think that we touched a good basis on the reparations. Uh, Medicare for all is something that's still a massive one for me. Um, I don't have a, a large um, area on, on our page about it, but specifically, yes, I'm absolutely in support of single payer coverage. Uh, Medicare for all is, it was recognized years ago when I ran for the House of Representatives. I talked about the importance uh, that there was a CBO estimate um, in 2020 that suggested that implementing Medicare for all then would have only cost about $0.7 trillion, so $700 billion <clears throat> in terms of um, in its implementation of it, but it would have reduced so much costs uh, across the board. And what we're currently we're, we're facing that we, we're still dealing with with uh, so many of our Americans, the debt, right? 
massive debt is associated with, with uh, medical debt, right? So we still mm-hmm. have to take into account that we need to work on potentially canceling large scale of the debt uh, for many of our Americans so they can actually breathe and not have to deal with that. It's, it's horrific. If we can go bail out and provide all these billions of dollars to these other countries that are waging wars, like for, for instance, Israel, that has the ability to provide those luxuries and things like that for their own people, that means we should be making sure we should be doing that for all of our, our Americans here. Um, and that's something that I'm going to be very direct with and very uh, very much in support of once I get in office. And I won't be one of those individuals who's going to get in office and then say, oh, I just care about quality health care. No, single parent coverage. Just move away from this. This system does not work. Absolutely does yeah. not work. And I'm full stop on that when I'm not doing that anymore with it. Uh, when it comes to do you have any question about that? Because I, I don't want to just keep talking. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, Medicare for all, I think it, I, the radical in me says that Medicare for all is a step in the right direction. I am uh, more for a nationalization of the healthcare system in general, mm-hmm. um, because uh, there is also with Medicare for all, there's room for, uh, you know, private hospitals and in, 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 in clinics and different medical facilities uh, to, you know, who operate on profit motives to uh, charge exorbitant amounts to the government itself. I think, honestly, it will also be more affordable for the government to have a nationalized healthcare system. And once you take the entirety of profit motive away from the medical system, then it also makes it so that the focus is on care instead mm-hmm. of profit at all. And that's so that's that that's just the radical in me. But I do like Medicare for all because it is a huge step in the right direction. Right. Thank you. Uh, and if I could, I want to touch on uh, what our vets um, I want to do some shifts, especially, especially, uh, especially pertaining to the GI Bill, right? Uh, the sure. GI Bill in itself, we need to get back to a place where when our veterans get out from service, transition from service, where they don't need to go and qualify for housing, right? That's something that is a massive problem. They mm-hmm. should not have to go and seek out their own um, what. Uh, to get uh, qualifications from a bank to provide them a loan. If you're going to say you have a zero interest loan, the federal government needs to go back into making sure that all of those veterans, once they transition from service, that they can go back, they can get access to a home. And this is also going to be consistent with my plan in general of making sure that we have housing as a fundamental right for all Americans. But in terms of how, how the pots are divvied up to make sure that veterans, as they transition out, we have the adequate amount of support that we know they can get straight into uh, housing to get um, from their their life of service, Um, increase the amount of transition assistance program related materials, as well as health care coverage. And this is something that's going to cost, you know, some more dollars from us in appropriations. But I think we need to do away with the way uh, we have our laps of coverages for our service members as they leave this leave service. uh, Regardless, they should have full health care, full dental. And this is something that people may not like, but guess what? We need to stop. If, if we care really about our people, you wouldn't send so many of our people into these situations, into conflict, into all these things where they come home. And then now we have to take care of them. So how mm-hmm. do we do that? We need to make sure that we expand those transition services. We need to make sure we expand more grants so they can build their businesses. Um, and also for the job guarantees. These are areas where once you come out of service, there should be no reason why uh, we have veterans who are homeless on our streets. No reason why we have veterans who don't have access to jobs. These are some things that is imperative that our agencies work more directly to ensure that those uh, services are provided and that all of our, our service members have access to jobs once they leave. Um, and yeah, consistent across the board with our housing first initiatives throughout the the country. I want to make sure that that's our the new direction of how we move. Is that we're no longer accepting that individuals can be homeless in this country. Um, 
when I think of like when calling, you know, nine one one, I think if I see a person on the street, that's a need. Uh, that's a matter of public safety. Seeing an individual living on the street, I don't care what what we're saying. That means that we're failing in our public safety because we've mm -hmm. established a structure that enables our citizens to not have housing security, and. Yeah. That is something that I'm not in. I'm no longer going to uh, allow this. I fought for housing as a right in almost every campaign that I've ever asked uh, fought for. When I ran to become a Cuyahoga County executive to lead over 1.2 million people in 2022, I established that it was we're going to have a housing as a fundamental right within the county, and that was how I was able to achieve 35% uh, of the vote to lead over the 1.2 million people, which was uh, would have been the youngest person ever to lead a major county in the state of Ohio out of the 88 counties, 1.2 million people. And the state of Ohio has just over 11 million people. So when some wow. people ask me questions like, what would put you into this place of being here? Well, I was just short away from actually leading over the second largest county of the state of Ohio, which will, I believe, puts me into in the room with any of these uh, public officials to address the needs of the, of the, of the people. Hmm. Okay, so as far as the housing first model, uh, you know, from uh, this uh, is something that I also is very um, close to my heart. Uh, it says rental assistance and eviction reform, expand rental assistance programs for more families and reform eviction laws to provide greater protections for tenants, establish a right to counsel in eviction proceedings to ensure fair legal representation for all renters. One of the things I think that a lot of people uh, don't know is that the, for instance, when it comes to rental assistance, Section 8 is actually on average has a five year waiting list. And so a lot of people and also uh, the criteria is so stringent that, you know, you could still be in poverty and not qualify for Section 8. And uh, and I, I'd be honest with you, and maybe some people may look at me wrong for this. But if there is a man in the household, that also would bar, unless that man is considered to be disabled, that if there's a man in the household, then that also precludes them uh, from also being able to get housing assistance, even though, you know, like uh, there's a lot of reports coming out now, uh, there's a lot of people who are going six to nine months without being able to get a job and so they're uh, living in poverty because uh, they can't get a job. And, you know, you have a lot of these companies that are saying that they're hiring, but they're not. And, and that's so, a horrible thing. That's such a horrible thing. I noticed as a, like, again, as a vet, I got out of the service with a bachelor's degree and I was finishing. I was just uh, almost done with my master's. I finished my master's in two, 2020. So I had just finished it a year after I got out of the service. I mean, I had one of the most terrible times transitioning, trying to find gainful employment. And I said, whoa, I was told I had all of these amazing uh, skills, you know, while I was in the service, but now they don't, tra they're not transferable to anything. And even with having a master's degree, it took me, it took me another two years before I got an official position doing something that was actually related to any of my degrees or any of my skills. I mean, I got out of there with all these back issues. And I mean, I'm a married man. I said, I can't sit myself down and not work. So I'm working in places, lifting stuff, menial labor, and I'm okay with that. Everything I got to do what I got to do to take care of my household. So for me, we're looking at it at, from that standpoint. If I have a master's degree and I'm going through that, I know this is, this is horrible what's happening all across the board. And yeah. and that's what was it one of those uh for the furthest myself of saying we have to shut it down. We have to shut it down. This structure is not working for the people. It's it's absolutely not working. And when you talk about section eight, I mean the horror stories I hear talking to individuals that they're waiting for the lottery, as they say, waiting for the lottery, and then when they finally get it, then there's the issues with the how the home that they're trying to get into. There is so many things that are absolutely making it much more difficult. It's making people give up. People are giving yep. up at, at times. Yep, absolutely. I, I have one more question, more yes. policy more policy question, if it's okay, if I can ask. Okay. So we're kind of touching on education now. What is your thoughts and policy on 
education uh, because as far as uh, I see, uh, a lot of people have been talking about the cancellation of student debt within the country, uh, you know, and there are policies, for instance, Dr. Jill Stein's policy is to make uh, up to four year college tuition free in public co colleges and universities, as well as in trade schools. What is your policy position in regards to education, especially higher education? Well, one uh, first one is I support the cancellation of student debt. I'm not on that side that people are, you know, are arguing where, well, if we're canceling student debt, well, who's going to pay for it? We, we, this country, again, established a rather exploitative structure, education structure that takes a massive advantage of those who already are dealing with the financial burden of, you know, transitioning into either the two-year or four-year institutions. So mm -hmm. if you're an individual who need access to those, you know, critical loans, obviously it's going to cause more harm for you over the time where your interest rates that they have, where you're paying almost so much of the interest, you're looking at, whoa, I've looked like I should have paid enough of the payment already, but, uh, or the principal, but this interest is, is so growing that I don't see I could ever pay it off. I mean, so there's some areas where I would look to that even with bankruptcy, I would say there's some changes where a student debt should be able to be, again, added back into bankruptcy. That's one of those areas uh, where you could actually remove it. Uh, that's one because that was taken off uh, by, our, by our legislators years ago. Um, I would yeah. say, too, in terms of the cancellation of student debt, absolutely. And I do support uh, Jill Stein's plan in terms of the two-year, four-year institutions, as well as even the um, for making sure that we're getting our individuals into the trades, right? And this is an area where, as senator, I will support those things. I will advocate for the passage of those uh, legislation in those areas um, to be direct. So, yes, um, and I hope I answered your question. And if I didn't, I can answer it more. No, you 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 uh, very very well. Uh, I would you know urge somebody like Joe Biden to uh, pass the Higher Education Act, but I don't ever see that happening. You know, which would also do a cancellation of student debt. So, and you know, look who holds a, a huge amount of student debt is people that look like you and me, and, and and a lot of black women that hold a lot of student debt. And so that would also be a boom, you know, to a, set, a, a subset of the black community. Yeah. People like me wouldn't affect because I actually never, you know, stepped foot in college. So for me, it wouldn't really yeah. affect. And, and, and real quick on that, too, the only issue I do have at times is there was this false impression that when President Biden first was trying to roll out the cancellation of the student debt in some sense, that this was going to be a reduction of the racial wealth gap. And those are the areas where the nuance where I say, well, that's not ad adequately true because um, of black black Americans, they only 25 percent of them are actually into the higher education system. Right. Which we talk about was it up to what 40 million borrowers or whatnot so you just take that into account we're not all of those borrowers so yes we are there's an increased uh likelihood that when we are borrowers we're probably Pell grant recipients so we're going to have there would have been increased uh impact positively for black people in some areas however when you looked at the overall standing statistically speaking it was not something that was going to reduce the racial wealth gap but it was something that was specifically going to uh, assist greatly for individuals who have sought out higher education and who sought out actual uh, loans for for those processes so i wasn't i was one of those individuals who saying i support it absolutely but i just had an issue where how it was presented and i think that that was one of those ways that, you know, the, Repu the Democrats do. And I will end with this one quick, too. Republicans have caught on to something when it comes to Democrats. They know that they can just tagline certain policies that the Democrats suck at actually really addressing. Like, for instance, what, what Trump did with the project, he did Kamala Harris 20, Project 2025, taxpayer funded reparations. We've never heard her, all, her, administ her current uh, candidacy directly say that they're going to pass reparations, but they're putting them on pressure saying that, well, look, are you going to actually pass it? And they're making it to show how bad they are right on two sides. Which one is it? Are you really for the black people? And then on the flip side, they're riling up their base, their anti reparations. Right. So the Democrats are failing on such massive proportions that they're not even taking it to the count. You have Kamala Harris in that debate. She said, I'm supporting more fracking. I'm going to be doing all of that for, for all of that. Right. I mean, it was it was actually 
mind boggling watching that debate, seeing that Trump, firstly, he, you know, he has his lies and all the things he does. But Kamala Harris, the red carpet was rolled out for her to say everything that the special interest groups in America really want. And it was just like, she's the greatest candidate of all time. That's how it was presented. And this is the problem we're having, which I'm supporting third party candidates. I will not support the current president, uh, current administration, and I will not be supporting Donald Trump. And I'm t- telling everyone out there in the state of Ohio, do not support the duopoly. Do not vote for either party. And unfortunately for Jill Stein in the state of Ohio, there is an issue associated where I don't believe she's going to be on the ballot anymore due to an issue where Butch Ware, when Butch Ware was selected, uh, they had Anita uh, Rios on. So they had an issue that caused it may actually not count her votes. Yeah, that's a uh, um, uh, big cluster mess. Uh, I will have to get more of the details from uh, Jill Stein's uh, campaign manager, Jason Call, on that one. But unfortunately, there is a mix up. I'm hoping that they can get that sorted out, but I'm not sure if they'll be able to have it sorted out in time, especially when they have to print the ballots. So, yeah, you know, as far as that goes, uh, you know, if in case they may end up having to write in Jill Stein and as well as you, you know, um, I'm hoping that, you know, they can get that sorted out. But I, you know, I have. I'm on pins and deals with that one. I'll just say that. Understood. Um, again, I'm just so I'm thankful that you uh, afforded me the opportunity to express, you know, you know, some of our issues. I really do. Of course, of course, and uh, you know, I I deeply appreciate a lot of these policy positions that you have put forth. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, go a little bit further, but uh, due to the sake of time, I'm unable to. But uh, I'm sure that. Uh, Will there be more uh, uh, policy positions uh, in the next few weeks that you'll be yes. putting on the website? Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, so you can look on um, some more things being expanded, especially uh, the questions you asked pertaining to student uh, student debt, um, mm-hmm. as well as uh, my stances regarding to rights to access, because I've been asked about this before, which I do support rights to access. Uh, but these are areas that wasn't on our pages that people have, you know, many of our individuals in the state have said we would like to see some of these, you know, things added on to it and wanted to, to see more issues expanded. So uh, that's no issue for me. I've made numerous stances beforehand on on these issues, which is publicly known in the state of Ohio that I've done. But I'm going to make sure that my website also uh, expands to illustrate some of those other things as well. Yeah. Um, some of the other ones, it will be ones like environment, especially which pertaining to climate change. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. And as well as uh, the uh, the issue of immigration as well. I know it's a very hotly contested issue. Um, but as far as, you know, you and I both are aware, especially of the military industrial complex and the foreign policy. I mean, to be honest with you, we all know where the source of, of, of the undocumented immigrants uh having to flee their countries is coming from and why so i think you know when you and touch that's on a, that's a powerful area and where i think we could be talking for hours on that because um understanding that that what the the united states impact is in these countries we do have to address the fact that it is causing massive mobilizations of per, of people leaving where they're at where, where they're living right and they're taking a trek across various countries across Latin America, coming up through Me- the state of Mexico, and then going mm-hmm. into the U.S. Uh, to the United States of America, and it's causing you know massive issues, right? Where the city governments who mm-hmm. have you know established themselves as some form of sanctuary cities or whatnot, they cannot handle the, the load of how many people, uh, sheer load of how many people are into those areas. Those municipal governments. This is an area where again I was a candidate to take over a whole county. So they have to have balanced budgets. If they don't have a balanced budget, something bad happens. They lose fiscal control. You lose fiscal control. It goes to the state comptroller, fiscal treasurer, whatever it is of that state. And that's something that um, is a massive concern uh, when you see across uh, some of our major cities. Um, I would love to talk and talk about this in another depth. But again, I'll expand these areas on my issues, on my issues page. All right. Thank you so very much. And just to let everybody know. I had put uh, Tariq's link for his website 
in the chat as well. So if you guys would like to, you guys can all go to Shabazz for census for Senate. Absolutely. And you guys can actually look and, and also, uh, of course, uh, just to reiterate, you are running a writing campaign in Ohio. So if you guys uh, need to just go straight to his website, you get the accurate spelling so that you guys can write, write it down, put it on a post-it note and stick it to your chest. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, and of course, uh, it is such a pleasure to have you. Really great to have this conversation and go over all these policy positions. And I can't wait to have you on again, including after the election as well. So we can continue to talk about these issues because I know you ain't going nowhere. No, I'm definitely not. We're here. So thank you so much again. I appreciate it for all the individuals who are watching this today and who's watching this tomorrow. This is firmly about addressing the needs of the people. Um, my campaign is specifically about addressing, um, reducing conflict abroad and addressing the uh, the longstanding uh, problems that has been caused by the U.S. federal government. And how do we do that? We remove these career politicians. We put in new leaders. So thank you so much. And I hope you all have an amazing day. Vote for that brother this November 5th, 2024. Thank you very much, Tariq. I'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further, so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses and have a beautiful day.